Good morning. This meeting will come to order. This is a public meeting of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. I'd like to welcome members of the public, market participants, and members of the media, as well as those taking part on the phone and via webcast. I'd also like to welcome my fellow commissioners, Commissioner Quintens, Commissioner Benham, Commissioner Stump, and Commissioner Berkovitz. Before we begin uh, with our opening statements, I'd like to invite everyone to begin our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Saying the pledge can remind us, even if we disagree on a particular policy issue, that we're all here to represent the American people. The agency has a proud history of collegiality among our commissioners, as well as our staff, regardless of the overall political and economic environment. So let's all rise for the pledge, which I would note starts with the word I and ends with the word all, a good reminder of why we're all here. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, the Republic which stands, one nation, under God, visible, for every team. Thank you. Please be seated. We'll start the meeting with opening statements um, uh, in order of seniority. So I will go first. Uh, this is my first public meeting. Uh, as chairman, and I am truly honored to be here. As we move forward with the agenda uh, this year and in future years, commission actions may be voted on through what we call the seriatim process, where no public meeting takes place. That process can be very efficient in handling matters of varying complexity. For instance, we used the seriatim process to complete a vote late last week on the final changes to the Volcker Rule. So that item has been removed from today's agenda. I'll be issuing a public statement later this afternoon, and several of my commissioners, fellow commissioners will do the same. I'd like to thank each of them for their thoughtful consideration of that rule. But it's also good for the public to have opportunities to see our agency in action. Although this is the first meeting of my chairmanship, it certainly won't be the last. In fact, I, tend to increase the fre I, tend, I intend to increase the frequency of open meetings to give the commissioners an opportunity to gather and deliberate on rules and other actions in a public setting. Now to the business at hand for this meeting. Today we gather to consider two measures. The first agenda item is a final rule amending position limits for security futures products. This final rule is a small but important step to ensure the consistent treatment of markets jointly regulated by the CFTC and the SEC. As regulators, we need to ensure consistency in our rules. This extends to how related financial products are treated. The markets, not the regulators, should ultimately decide which financial products are useful. By treating related products equally across regulatory regimes, we avoid dictating winners and losers. Securities futures serve functions similar to instruments in the traditional securities markets, including stop, stock options and short selling. If they serve similar functions, then we should treat them in a similar way. One way we can ensure comparable treatment is to make our position limits on securities futures equivalent to the SEC's limits on stock options. I want to thank the Division of Market Oversight, along with the Office of the Chief Economist and the Office of General Counsel for their hard work in preparing this first rule for a final vote. Specifically, from DMO, Vince McGonigal, Greg Kusirk, Tom Leahy, Aaron Brodsky, Dana Brown, from the Office of the Chief Economist, Mike Pennick, and from the Office of the General Counsel, Elise Bruntel, Laura Badian, and Carlene Kim. The second rule we are voting on is a proposed change to Part 13 of the Commission's regulations, which describe the agency's public rulemaking procedures. Now, the Administrative Procedures Act, the APA, governs our rulemaking procedures uh, regardless of what our own rules say. Our Part 13 was intended to track the APA. The APA has changed over time, but our Part 13 has not. To avoid potential conflicts and confusion, we are proposing to eliminate most of the provisions of Part 13 and thereby default to the governing language of the APA. The proposal will maintain Section 13.2, which permits any person to petition the Commission for a rulemaking. In this way, we'll maintain a unique feature of our rules, 
the ability of anyone to petition for a rulemaking, something that's not in the APA, while removing redundancies and potential points of conflict with the APA. Relatedly, but separate from this rulemaking, I've asked our staff to develop a plain English description of how our rulemaking process works. Underlying both the APA and Part 13 is a commitment to engage with the public on the rules. We want to make sure everyone knows how to do so. Let me thank the staff of the Office of General Counsel for their hard work to ensure that our rulemaking process complies with our obligations under both the APA and the Sunshine Act. Specifically, from the Office of General Counsel, Carlene Kim, Arminio Castro, and Deval Patel. And now I'd like to recognize my fellow commissioners so they can offer their opening statements. Commissioner Quintens, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for, uh, for calling this meeting. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, and privilege to be up here with you on your first meeting as the chairman of the uh, Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Uh, very much looking forward to working with you on your priorities uh, throughout your tenure. Uh, I'm very encouraged at the uh, discussions that we've had so far uh, on those priorities and uh, have already seen the impact of your leadership on the agency. So um, uh, uh, welcome uh, to, to the agency in your first open meeting. Um, I'm pleased to support both of uh, the proposals today, uh, which I believe are examples of good government. The Commission's regulations establishing position limits and position accountability levels for security futures products, or FSPs, have not been substantively amended to account for market developments since they were first adopted in 2001. While position limits on equity options have increased over time, the Commission's SFP position limits have remained unchanged. Today's final rule increases the default maximum level of equity SFP position limits that exchanges may set and modifies the criteria exchanges apply when setting higher position limits to be based primarily on deliverable supply. These long overdue updates to SFP position limits aim to provide regulatory comparability with equity options and minimize competitive disparity between those two markets. I'm also pleased to support the second rulemaking before us today. The Commission is updating its rulebook to eliminate the unnecessary and defunct Part 13 rulemaking procedures. The APA governs the Commission's rulemaking proce process, and it is unnecessary and confusing to codify that process in a Commission regulation that then becomes duplicative of the APA itself. I'd like to add my thanks and congrats to DMO, OCE, and uh, OGC on all of their hard work and look forward to hearing the proposals from the staff. Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Quintens. Commissioner Benham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first off, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for calling the meeting. Welcome. Um, echoing a lot of the things Commissioner Quinten said, we are, we are pleased to have you. And it's been about two months now, but um, looking forward to the months ahead uh, under your leadership. Um, I, as well, will be supporting both rules today. Look forward to the discussion. Um, and to, to echo what you said about the Volcker rule, um, my, my dissent will be, I, like my colleagues as well, be listed on the, the website later today and published in the Federal Register notice as well. Um, and I look forward to the discussion. And I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, specifically for working with my office um, uh, on the Part 13 proposal and, and also on the Securities Future proposal. So thank you and look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Commissioner Benham. Commissioner Stump. In my opening statement at the first meeting, at my first meeting last November, I noted that the directive from the leaders of the G20 summit instructed member nations to assess regularly regulatory implementation of the new rules that would be adopted in response to the financial crisis. I believe that as a matter of sound regulation, we should undertake the same type of look back for all of our rules. It is simply good government to revisit our rules and assess whether certain rules need to be updated evaluate whether rules are achieving their objective, and identify rules that are falling short and should be withdrawn or improved. I commend the chairman for this, his first meeting, giving us just that opportunity to do a review of some rules that might have required updating. Regarding position limits for security futures products, with two decades having passed, it is hard to recall 
the one of the big issues of the day in the futures world around the turn of the century was removing the prohibition on single stock futures and futures on narrow base security indexes. In the Commodity Futures Modernization Act of 2000, Congress repealed the prohibition and permitted these products, which is called Security Futures Products, or S SFPs for short, to be traded under a system of joint regulation by the CFTC and the SEC. In a journal article published shortly thereafter, William Brodsky, then chairman of the, and CEO of the Chicago Board Options Exchange, borrowed from the Beatles to describe the journey that had culminated in the trading of SFPs as a long and winding road. He cautioned, though, that with a system of dual regulation of SFPs, and I quote, the road will still meander onward. Unfortunately, the intervention of global financial crisis and the ensuing decade of intense focus on swaps reform delayed us in taking stock, apologies for the pun, and where we are and on that road and whether a modest change in direction might be appropriate. I am pleased that we are now doing so with respect to position limits and position accountability for SFPs. As always, of course, we are bound by the dictates of our governing statute. In the CFMA, Congress intended that SFPs be regulated comparably to security options traded on national securities exchanges. The final rulemaking we are voting on today is true to that intent as it will harmonize the default exchange set position limits levels for equity SFPs to that for equity options traded on security exchanges. It also will, among other things, make the position limit rule for SFPs more consistent with rules for other futures contracts, adjust the time during which position limits must be in effect, and enhance exchange discretion in administering position limits for SFPs in certain respects. It is my hope that these amended rules, together with the final action of the joint proposal that we issued with the, SS, with the SEC over the summer on minimum customer margin requirements for SFPs will promote increased trading activity, improved liquidity, and SFP products. Regarding our public rulemaking procedures, when rules adopted in 1976, shortly after the birth of this agency, have not been touched in 43 years, it is time to take a look. That is the case with our Part 13 rules governing the Commission's rulemaking process. Although the CFTC's rulemakings are subject to the Administrative Procedures Act, the APA has changed over the years, while the Part 13 rules have not. Streamlining the Commission's rule book by withdrawing the Part 13 rules, other than the rule providing for petition of rulemaking, would eliminate any confusion resulting from the existing disparities while confirming that the CFTC adheres and will continue to adhere to the APA requirements. This rulemaking would not repeal or limit in any way the rights of the public in, in engaging in CFTC rulemaking under the APA. I'm pleased to support both of the rulemakings before us today, and I want to thank the, the staff of the Division of Market Oversight and the General Counsel's Office for their time and their efforts and for answering questions and addressing comments from my team. Thank you, Commissioner Stump. Commissioner Berkovit. It's red. It's on. Okay, I thought red meant off, but red means on. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for educating me on our new procedures here, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, and welcome. I, 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 too, would like to extend my um, welcome to your first uh, open meeting as, as chairman. It's been a pleasure to work with you over the past couple of months, and um, I welcome your commitment uh, to openness and doing the public's business in, in public. Uh, that's something that uh, in uh, my original uh, time here and in my current time here, a value that I uh, share very highly and believe in very deeply that we should be doing the public's business in public. Um, Sometimes uh, the Government and Sunshine Act is criticized uh, for actually hampering uh, deliberations and uh, the ability of an agency to get work done because it means that no more than three of us, or three of us can't get together, no more than two of us can get together at any one time uh, and talk about business unless it's a public meeting or there's a specific exemption under the Sunshine Act that permits it. So Sunshine Act is sometimes as criticized as uh, being counterproductive to agency uh, collegiality. But uh, let me quote, uh, read a quote from the Interpretive Guide to the Government in the Sunshine Act, which uh, uh, I think I've permanently borrowed from OGC. 
Um, but the Interpretive Guide to the Government Assumption Act, which basically has all the interpretations of all the exemptions and commentary, says, quote, the most serious attack on implementation of the Sunshine Act is the claim that it has compromised the collegiality that is supposed to be the cornerstone of the decisional process at multi-member agencies. However, it is important to recognize that agency statutes and traditions and the personality of agency members, especially the chair, are dominant factors that also help determine that le the level of collegiality at a particular agency. And I, I, I'm proud to be a member of this agency where we have the statutes, we have the traditions, and we have the personality of the members, and we've always had personality of the chair that have really supported this collegiality. I'm just very proud to be a member of, of, of this agency where uh, we can conduct our business in public and, and we conduct our business generally in a very collegial way. And I thank you for that and look forward to working with you and my fellow commissioners in, in this manner as we go forward. I, I too am going to uh, be uh, supporting both the rules in, in, uh, before us today. I think both of these rules, uh, the changes, um, are necessary updates to, to modernize both, both of these rules. Conform. I view them both as consistent with our current policies and practices uh, while modernizing the, the position limits and updating the procedures. Um, I, I think it's simply a re both rules are a reflection of where current practices and policies uh, should take us. Um, they, they will not impose any greater risk uh, upon the public nor any diminishment uh, of the public's right to participate in, in agency rulemakings. Uh, I too have a, a lengthy statement uh, on the Volcker Rule that will be published uh, um, later today on the, on the Commission's website and will also accompany uh, the Federal uh, Register release. I have a, uh, I'm going to be dissenting and, and uh, my views are laid out in detail um, in that manner. So I look forward to today's uh, um, discussions and, and future discussions as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Berkovitz, and, and thank you all. Again, I want to reiterate uh, how much of an honor, privilege, and also uh, a good experience it's been to have you all as, as my colleague, as, as fellow commissioners. So thank you again. For each of the two items on today's agenda, the staff will make presentations to the commission. After each presentation, the floor will be open from questions from each commissioner and for discussions between and among commissioners. Following the discussion on each matter, the Commission will vote on the staff recommendation as presented. All final votes conducted in this public meeting will be recorded votes. The results of the votes approving the issuance of rulemaking documents will be included with those documents in the Federal Register. To facilitate the preparation of approved documents for publication in the Federal Register, I would now ask the Commission to grant unanimous consent for the staff to make necessary technical corrections to those documents prior to submitting them to the Office of the Federal Register. So moved. Second. Thank you. Without objection, so ordered. At this time, I'd like to welcome the following staff for their presentations on a final rule amending position limits on securities futures. We have with us today Vince McGonigal, Acting Director of the Division of Market Oversight, Greg Kusirk, Deputy Director, and Tom Leahy, Associate Director. Uh, gentlemen, you, you have the floor. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to present the Security Futures Product Position Limit and Position Accountability Rule to you. Separately, with respect to the SFP market, the Commission has proposed, in conjunction with the Securities and Exchange Commission, amendments to customer margin related to security futures. Those rules, however, are not before us today. I'd also like to take a moment to thank and recognize the hard work of certain staff members and former staff members, Tom Leahy, Aaron Brodsky of uh, DMO, and also Reva Adriance and Steve Sherrod, formerly of DMO. Uh, Dana Brown, formerly with DMO and now with OIA. Mike Pennick from OCE. And Elise Bruntel, Laura Badian, and Carleen Kim of OGC. Today's staff is recommending that the Commission approve for publication a notice of final rulemaking to amend and update the Commission's position limit and position accountability rules for security futures products, SFPs. In December of 2000, Congress passed and the President signed into law the Commodity Futures 
Modernization Act of 2000, the CFMA. Among other provisions, the CFMA lifted the ban on futures based on single securities and narrow-based security indices. The CFMA specified that SFPs may be based only on common stock, although it author also authorized the Commission and the Securities and Exchange Commission to jointly allow SFPs to be based on other types of securities. In 2001, the Commission adopted rules to establish position limits and position accountability for security futures products. Under these rules, the default net position is 13,500 contracts of 100 shares per contract. A designated contract market could adopt a net position limit of 22,500 contracts if the average daily trading volume in the underlying security exceeded 20 million shares over the preceding six months or if that Average daily trading volume exceeded 15 million shares, and the number of, out, of underlying shares outstanding was more than 40 million. These position limits were based loosely on position limit rules for security options listed on national security exchanges. Under the existing rules, position limits are in effect during the last five trading days before expiration. A DCM could adopt position accountability in lieu of position limit if the average daily trading volume in the underlying security over the preceding six months exceeded 20 million shares and the number of outstanding shares in the underlying security exceeded 40 million shares. The net position accountability level is 22,500 contracts. The existing rules also specify that a DCM recalculate the average daily trading volume over the preceding six months on a monthly basis and adjust the position limit or position accountability as appropriate. The Commission has not substantively changed these SFP position limit and position accountability rules since they were adopted in 2001. The Commission and the SEC at various times jointly issued rules and orders to expand the set of securities that may underlie a security futures product. Security futures products may be and are based on exchange-traded funds, closed-end funds, trust-issued receipts, and American depository receipts. SFPs also may be based on single-name, non-exempt debt instruments, although no DCM has listed such SFPs. The final amended rules increase the default position limit uh, level for SFPs that are based on securities issued in shares to 25,000 contracts, net or on the same side of the market and provide flexibility to adopt position limits above this default level if the estimated deliverable supply of the underlying security is greater than 20 million shares. Specifically, a DCM could adopt a position limit that is no greater than 12.5% of the estimated deliverable supply of shares, net or on the same side of the market. Also, the amended rule reduces the time during which position limits may be in effect to the last three trading days from the last five trading days. A DCM could adopt position accountability in lieu of a position limit of 25,000 contracts net or on the same side of the market. An SFP qualifies for position accountability in lieu of a position limit if the underlying security has a total trading volume of at least 2.5 billion shares over a six month period and has an estimated deliverable supply of more than 40 million shares. These criteria are similar to the current criteria for adopting position accountability, except that the trading volume is expressed as a total over six months rather than a daily average over six months, and the number of shares is calculated as an estimate of the deliverable supply rather than out shares outstanding. The amended rule also provides guidance that estimated deliverable supply of securities issued in shares should be no greater than the free float of the security. The amended rule also addresses position limits for physically delivered baskets of securities. The rule specifies that the position limit for such contracts be set consistent with a position limit on an SFP based on the component security with the lowest estimated deliverable supply. For cash settled SFPs on narrow based indices, the amended rule provides guidance that the position limit be set at the level of an option listed on the same index. 
Alternatively, a DCM may set a position limit based on the deliverable supply and liquidity of the underlying securities. For SFPs on single-name, non-exempt debt instruments, the rule provides guidance that a DCM may adopt a position level that is not greater than 12.5% of the estimated deliverable supply. The guidance specifies that the estimated deliverable supply should not include the amount committed for long-term agreements. Staff notes that estimates of deliverable supply of the underlying security and trading volume in the underlying security may change over time. Therefore, the amended rule specifies that a DCM listing SFPs must evaluate these metrics no less frequently than a semi-annual basis and adjust position limits and position accountability accordingly. Staff further notes that this evaluation is less frequent than the current requirement to evaluate the average daily trading volume on a monthly basis to set position limits and position accountability. My colleagues and I would be happy to answer any question. Thank you. Thank you very much for that informative presentation. To begin the Commission's discussion and consideration of these rulemakings, I'll now entertain a motion to adopt the Division of Market Oversight's final rule relating to security futures position limits as presented by the staff. So move. Second. Thank you. I would now like to open the floor to allow my fellow commissioners to ask any questions you may have. Uh, why don't we go ahead and start, Commissioner Quintens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we, we received just one comment letter on this proposal. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. And, and that comment letter indicated support for the changes, but also noted that without margin relief or changes to the margin protocols, the changes would not have that much effect. And I was wondering if you could give us your thoughts as to uh, whether or not you believe the changes presented today will have a positive effect on liquidity in the market for SFPs and uh, to what degree uh, and how that relates to the argument presented. Um, markets have, have long contended that uh, position limits that are too restrictive could inhibit trading. Now, not saying that that is or is not the case, but what we have observed over the last 17 years of trading in security futures is that liquidity and trading volumes could be better. We don't know what, to what extent um, position limits have caused that. There are other factors that might have a greater impact on that. Um, However, we believe that the position limit rule that we're presenting today would allow DCMs to adopt position limits that will allow larger positions and that um, and, and will appropriately protect market participants and market integrity. Okay, thank you. So, so it's a net positive, but because there could be other constraints, uh, we may not see the full result of uh, this position limit change absent other changes. Well. That is correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Benham? Uh, just a quick question. And first of all, thanks to all of you for your work on this. Um, in terms of the communication between the commission, the, um, the issuer, and the exchange in terms of when the float or the amount of underlying securities changes, and if the percentage should fall or go above 12.5%, depending on the amount of stock that's available. What, if any, communication occurs between the issuer, the exchange, and the commission? Well, free float is um, it's a widely public, published uh, metric of shares out, or, or it's a widely published metric. Uh, the, the, uh, you can find it on, on various websites and, and uh, financial information vendors. I guess m so, my yeah. question is more about if, they ha if the, in the, the exchange has to change the, the limit itself because the float is changing. If, and if, I, yeah, if, if the exchange has to change that limit, um, they, they, would just, they could certify that the amended uh, position limit to the commission. Um, but they would be responsible for, for monitoring whether that changes on a semi-annual basis. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Stump. I have no questions. Thank you. Commissioner Berkovich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just have a few questions for the staff, and thank you for your, your work on this and coming to my office and, and, and briefing me on this. Appreciate the information. Um, so as I understand it, this final rule will uh, almost double the default, uh, which I guess is the lowest or the upper bound that they could have. At least they have to have at least that position limit, um, uh, and that's almost double from where it, where it currently is. And I think you've, you've explained that the motivating rationale for this, this rulemaking is to really move our limits uh, on a par with uh, the security the options limits so that there's not an advantage to trading in one form or the other, that the limits are pretty much the same. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. So we're raising ours so it's on a par with theirs. Um, and I think you mentioned this, but can you just ex explain a little, or as, as much as necessary, why raising this level you believe this does not pose any more risk to the market, you know, excessive speculation, or any of the um, harms that position, which is the purpose of position limits, manipulation, excessive speculation. We're almost doubling this default, so how can you provide uh, with, with what is the basis for that assurance? Um, the securities exchanges increased position limits on options, gosh, probably 12 years ago to, to the the, 25, the default level was increased to 25,000 contracts. In that period of time, um, there hasn't been any issues that would lead us to believe that uh, increasing the position limit, the maximum default position limit for security futures also would, would cause any, any problems uh, associated with the excessive speculation. Be because they could essentially have that same position on the securities exchanges now, it's just in the form of options, so Ex exactly. their market position, they can already have that position in the market and we haven't seen any issues. Exactly. Okay. And just, just to follow on that, Commissioner, so certainly the exchange have other core principle requirements in place to make sure that contracts, for example, are not readily susceptible to manipulation. So we would think um, evaluation of position limits, position accountability is uh, one area amongst other obligations that the exchange has to make sure that uh, there's sufficient market integrity with respect to the contracts they list. And is it, is it correct to say that, e that the um, levels and the method of calculation of these default limits um, is, um, spot month limits is, is consistent or roughly consistent with how it's done for other commodities as well. This is not a unique way of calculating limits that we're imposing uh, on these products. Um, that, that's correct. Um, there is one difference, though. The guidance that, that the Commission has put out with respect, well, for other commodities uh, in setting position limits, it um, specifies no more than 25% of estimated deliverable supply, but we are um, we're saying 12.5% for the security futures. And the reason for that is that positions in security options and security futures would not be combined for the purpose of, of compliance with position limits. So if a trader had a position at a limit on the security option and a limit at the limit in a security future, it would be approximately 25% uh, of estimated deliverable supply. Okay, th thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, finally, um, th the final rule allows for position accountability uh, uh, for, for security futures. Um, my understanding that's consistent with the current rules that there's already, for these products, there's already position accountability. So to the extent that uh, this, the final rule uh, permits position accountability, that too is consistent with current practice for these, these financial products? That is correct. The, the, the rules that we changed amended for position accountability, just alter it slightly. Rather than using an average daily trading volume over six months, we've used a total trading volume. So we used the same amount, uh, the, the same metric, except we, we, we essentially multiplied the threshold by 125, which is approximately the number of trading days over a six-month period. And we changed the shares outstanding to uh, deliverable supply, which again would be uh, most likely free float. Okay, thank you. I appreciate, uh, appreciate uh, your, uh, your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Berkovitz. 
Uh, I just have one question, and that's that when you when you look at these proposed changes to Part 41 and compare them to our traditional commodity limits under Part 150, uh, here we're not necessarily specifying specific uh, futures contracts. Uh, and so the rule is written in such a way that it can include uh, future instruments that are not currently listed. I just wanted to, uh, was wondering if you could explain uh, the rationale for that and whether or not you think the rule is flexible enough um, should, should new instruments come into play. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think the rule is flexible enough for a DCM to discern what a position limit should be. If, if, if the commissions, the SEC and the CFTC, were to expand the set of securities that could underlie a security futures product. Um, if what we have um, presented today is, is not consistent with, with that underlying security, this commission could at that time adopt a rule uh, for uh, how, how a position limit should be established. Great, thank you. Uh, having concluded the discussion, would any commissioner like to make any further statements uh, before we proceed to vote on the motion? Okay, are the commissioners prepared to vote? Okay, if so, Mr. Kirkpatrick, our Secretary of the Commission, will you please call the roll? The motion now before the Commission is on the adoption of the final rule on position limits and position accountability for security futures products. Commissioner Berkovitz. Commissioner Berkovitz votes aye. Commissioner Stump. Commissioner Stump votes aye. Commissioner Benham. Aye. Commissioner Benham votes aye. Commissioner Quintens. Aye. Commissioner Quintens votes aye. Chairman Tarbert. Aye. Chairman Tarbert votes aye. Mr. Chairman, on this matter, the ayes have five, the noes have zero. Well, the ayes have it, and the motion to adopt the final rule is hereby approved. Okay. Thank you very much to the staff from DMO. Thank um, you. At this time, I'd like to welcome the following staff for their presentations on a proposed rule amending the Commission's regulations relating to the Administrative Procedure Act from the Office of General Counsel. Uh, specifically, uh, Dan Davis, our General Counsel, and Herminio Castro, our Associate General Counsel. Please begin. Uh, thank you, Chairman Tarbert and uh, commissioners for the opportunity to present these proposed revisions to Part 13 of the CFTC's regulations regarding public rulemaking procedures. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of my colleagues in OGC for their daily diligence and professionalism in advancing the mission of the agency. A special thanks goes today to Arminio Castro and Deval Patel, who brought this proposed rule to fruition. Without further ado, I turn the time over to Mr. Castro to make the staff presentation. Good morning. Um, I would like to thank you uh, for the opportunity to uh, make this presentation uh, for the Part 13 proposed rule. Today, staff recommends that the Commission adopt the proposed rule to amend Part 13 of the Commission's regulations. Part 13 of the Commission's regulations was originally promulgated in 1976 and has not been updated since that time. It sets forth the rulemaking procedures for the formulation, amendment, or repeal of rules that directly affect the public. The proposed rule would eliminate the provisions in Part 13 that sets forth the process for issuing rulemakings. As originally adopted, Part 13 was intended to track the rulemaking process set forth in the Administrative Procedure Act, or APA. Because the APA governs the Commission rulemaking process, it is unnecessary to maintain this process in a Commission regulation. Also, in its current form, Part 13 does not fully conform to the APA, which may create ambiguity and confusion about the procedures to be followed by the Commission in rulemakings. Accordingly, the final rule eliminates the provisions that set forth the process for, formulating, uh, for promulgating rulemakings. 
Part 13, as amended, would, however, retain Regulation 13.2, which describes the process for filing a petition for rulemaking, which the APA does not specifically address. I would like to thank Daval Patel, counsel with OGC, for her assistance drafting this rule. We are now happy to take questions. Many thanks for that presentation. At this point, I'll entertain a motion to approve the Office of General Counsel's Notice of Proposed Rulemaking related to Part 13 Administrative Procedures as presented by the staff. So moved. Second. Thank you. I would now like to open the floor to allow my fellow commissioners to ask any questions you might have. Why don't we go ahead this time and start with Commissioner Burke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Herminio uh, and, and uh, General Counsel Davis. Has anybody, uh, you mentioned since 1976, um, has anybody, apart from the request to initiate a rulemaking, somebody says we'd like you, has anybody ever like come to us and said, please follow Part 13 rather than the APA? Or are people, are people making requests based on Part 13 that, that um, rather than the APA or anything? Aside from petitions for rulemakings, there's no other amendment that I can recall. So basi basically, what I'm trying to get at this, these procedures in Part 13, other than 13.2, which we will be retaining, haven't been used at all. They're, they're there, but haven't been used. We use the APA, correct? That's correct. Okay. And the, and the, the chairman, I, I think I support what, what the uh, the chairman described in his opening statement as putting on our website. I, I know other agencies have pages uh, uh, on, their, on their website that describe the rulemaking process. So if somebody wants to know, one of the values of, of having the rules is somebody says, well, I, I, how, what are the rulemaking procedures that, that apply to this agency? And we know that the APA governs us, but I, I think it's helpful for the public. It doesn't necessarily have to be in, in the CFR, but if they want to know, is the commission subject to the APA or what are the procedures? that there's something the agency is informing the public. Um, so I, uh, the chairman described doing that. I think uh, my understanding is we're, you'll be working on a web page uh, to do this where pe people can, there'll be like rulemaking process, people can click on it and it'll describe, it'll say we're governed by the APA and then sort of generally describe in non-legally binding terms what that process is, notice and comment, et cetera. Is, is, that, is that the intent? Is that correct? That's, that's correct. Yeah, I, I think that's a great idea, Mr. Chairman, because uh, if, you, if you just look at Part 13, it, it, it actually may be misleading in terms of, uh, well, this is what they say they're going to do, but what about the Administrative Procedure Act? But if we have something on our website that says we're governed by the APA and provide a rough outline in plain English what that means uh, in non-legally binding terms, um, but we are bound by the APA. So I think that will be informative and helpful to the public. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Berkovitz. Before I turn to Commissioner Stump, I just want to say that uh, credit is due to Commissioner Benham, who, who recommended uh, that, that we put the public, and I, and I totally agree. It's a great recommendation, and we will, we will move forward on it. Uh, Commissioner Stump. I have no question. Commissioner Benham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Thanks to the team for doing this. I guess one quick question, and I, I don't, we don't need to get into too many specifics um, if it's uh, an exhaustive question, but can you maybe elucidate on how the APA has changed, APA has changed and why it's not consistent anymore um, as opposed to it being consistent in the past? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, specifically, the APS, of course, uh, through case law has changed. And, uh, in uh, light of that, we've revisited Part uh, 13 and noticed that certain provisions, particularly um, regarding hearings, uh, didn't exactly um, relate to the APS currently uh, interpreted by case law. Um, for example, th uh, Section 13.4 conflates the formal uh, rulemaking and informal rulemaking process, and um, whereas Section 553 uh, of the APA provides for notice and comment rulemaking, which is generally what the commissions follow. And uh, there's a separate process, uh, which is called the formal rulemaking process, which uh, involves more like trial-like uh, uh, process. And um, Part 13 does, does not differentiate between uh, those processes. And uh, so that's one of the examples we identified 
in the in the actual rulemaking. I mean, the actual proposal uh, in the actual current Part 13, which we would like to uh, amend. Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I fully support your efforts to streamline and to make our statute better. And I think with the web page, which I really appreciate you working uh, with me on. We have struck the right balance between making uh, a better rule set that's up to date and consistent with the, the rules that we have to follow, but also balancing that against the very important um, uh, task and requirement that we have, as Commissioner Berkovitz suggested, to make sure the public is fully aware of what we do, how we do it, when we do it. So um, I, I look forward to supporting this, and thanks for your leadership. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Quinten. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. No questions, just uh, a lot of gratitude to OGC and Mr. Castro for your work on this. Thank you. Terrific. And I, I had the same question that Commissioner Benham had, just to get a sense of the, the various inconsistencies. In the beginning of my career, I clerked for the D.C. Circuit, and there, although the Administrative Procedure Act was from the late 1940s, I believe, uh, it is somewhat organic and growing as case law uh, decides uh, various nuances uh, and therefore, we would find ourselves in a situation where we would potentially have to constantly update our rules uh, to, to relate to the APA. It's probably easier just to simply default to the APA, but then have the website uh, that allows us in plain English to explain to the public you know, what the rulemaking procedures are. So thank you very much. Having concluded the discussion, would any commissioner like to make any further statements before we proceed to the motion? Okay, are the commissioners prepared to vote? Okay, if so, Mr. Kirkpatrick, would you please call the roll? The motion now before the commission <clears throat> is on the approval of the notice of proposed rulemaking on part 13 public rulemaking procedures. Commissioner Berkovitz. Aye. Commissioner Berkovitz votes aye. Commissioner Stump. Aye. Commissioner Stump votes aye. Commissioner Benham. Aye. Commissioner Benham votes aye. Commissioner Quintens. Aye. Commissioner Quintens votes aye. Chairman Tarbert. Aye. Chairman Tarbert votes aye. Mr. Chairman, on this matter, the ayes have five, the noes have zero. The ayes have it, and the motion to approve the notice of proposed rulemaking carries. Before we move to, thank you very much. Uh, before we move to closing statements, I was asked, is there any other commission business? Okay. I have want to just take a brief moment to address uh, some major news from over the weekend. It was reported that key Saudi Arabian oil production facilities were attacked in a series of coordinated strikes. These attacks are believed to have impacted as much as half of the kingdom's crude production which is about 5% of global production. As we do following any major event with the potential to move markets, the CFTC immediately began monitoring trading in the impacted markets under our jurisdiction. Rest assured, we'll continue to be vigilant as the situation unfolds. But there being no other business, I would now like to give my fellow commissioners an opportunity to make closing statements. And we will start with Commissioner Berkham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to, I actually have already supported both of the rules before us today. Uh, let me just give a few ad additional comments um, uh, on, on, on my thinking. On uh, security uh, futures products, the final rule that we have approved today um, updates the requirements that the Commission originally adopted more than 18 years ago and have remained largely unchanged since then. It helps align the SFP position limits with the limits uh, that national securities exchanges applies to equity options. These measures, together with the recent SFP margin proposals issued jointly with the SEC, will help to level the regulatory playing field between SFP, security futures products, and equity options. It is important to ensure that regulatory differences do not disadvantage SFPs as a product class while maintaining effective position limits to protect markets and market participants. The final rule is consistent with the Commodity Futures Modernization Act's intent that SFPs and security options be subject to comparable regulation, including in any position limits applicable to SFPs and equity options. In 2001, the Commission adopted spot month position limits 
requirements for SFPs that were broadly analogous to the equity option limits in place at the time. Higher limits or position accountability were permitted based on the average daily trading volume and the number of shares outstanding of the security underlying an SFP. Today's final rule increases the default SFP position limits in line with the current minimum position limits in equity options. Position limits are important to fair, well-functioning markets. The Commission has noted that national securities exchanges have raised position limits on equity options with no apparent adverse impact. The preamble to the final rule also reiterates boards of trade's obligations under the core principles to adopt position limits or accountability to, quote, reduce the threat of market manipulation or congestion. These obligations would include establishing SFP position limits that are lower than the levels specified in this final rule, if necessary and appropriate. The final rule also amends the calculation method for SFP limits above the default level to incorporate a percentage of deliverable supply. In this regard, the final rule more closely aligns the SFP limits with the Commission's historical practice of considering alternative of considering deliverable supply in setting spot month limits for physical delivery contract. The final rule also allows for position accountability based on the most liquid of underlying securities. Again, I commend the staff for their hard work on this final rule. On the uh, rule to revise Part 13, in addition to updating uh, uh, and conforming our, 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 what we have in the Federal Register with the Administrative Procedure Act, this rulemaking provides us with an opportunity to request comment from the public who's most affected by these public rulemaking uh, procedures on improving the Commission's rulemaking process. Section 2A12 of the Commodity Exchange Act authorizes the Commission to promulgate regulations governing the Commission's procedures. I encourage the public to submit comments recommending procedures the Commission could adopt to enhance the transparency and effectiveness of our rulemaking process and the opportunities for public comment. Again, I strongly support uh, uh, this proposal and uh, commend Commissioner Benham uh, and, and the Chairman for their work uh, to get uh, uh, the web page uh, uh, project going, so this will all be very clear to the public. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Berkovitz. Uh, Commissioner Quintens uh, will be representing us uh, in Singapore later this week and therefore has to catch a flight in short order. So uh, we've agreed to allow Commissioner Quintens to go ahead and, and go, go next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and um, uh, thank you for working with uh, me and the cooperation of all my colleagues scheduling this open meeting today around that uh, travel commitment so that we can get the first of what I hope are many more open meetings uh, done with. And I look forward to the, the rest of the uh, open dialogue that we'll have. Um, I was very pleased to support both the final rule and the proposed rule today and, and compliment the staff uh, and, uh, and you, Mr. Chairman, on continuing to look at all of our regulations as the CEA, as case law, and as our, our, our rule book grow to ensure uh, that outdated regulations are removed and that our regulations can be updated to correspond um, to um, what we see coming out of other agencies into the market dynamics that exist. So uh, big compliments to the staff. Thank you for your leadership and um, appreciate the, uh, the generosity of the commission in working with me on the scheduling. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Commissioner Stump? Um, I just wanted to um, extend gratitude to a number of people. First, I want to thank the chairman. Thank you so much. This was a great meeting. I'm a stickler for efficiency. Anyone who's ever worked with me, I like to get things done efficiently, and this is probably the most efficient meeting I've been a part of to date. Some of that is due to the fact that the matters we were considering were, were truly, in my opinion, housekeeping matters, but that's not to suggest that they're not equally as important as the other things we do. Um, all of the teams that worked on these two rule sets have tremendous demands on their time, all day, every day. And I really appreciate you all taking the time to help us um, encourage the agency to be more uh, detail-oriented and, and more um, better aligned with, with what we are doing with the SEC, as well as the APA. So I really appreciate everyone's time and efforts with regard to this. And I wanted to take this opportunity to also thank the folks who work on my team. 
It's been a tremendous summer. We've been extremely busy. I'm certain that most of them did not go home before the early hours of the morning for much of the summer. So thanks to Dan Boxa, Elizabeth Master Giacomo, and Terry Arbit for their time. Thank you very much, Commissioner Stump. Commissioner Benham. Uh, quickly, Mr. Chairman, thanks for your leadership. Great meeting uh, this morning. Um, thanks to my colleagues, of course, and thanks to the teams both. Um, great presentations and great work product. Um, reiterating a lot of the things we heard today, these are good examples of streamlining our rule set, efficiency, and doing what's right by, I think, both the agency and the market. It's the market evolved, um, leadership changes, and statute uh, moves along with time. So. Um, look forward to the continued work of the commission in the near future, and thanks again to you for working with us, my team specifically. Um, a, a, a very positive sign for our work relationship. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Benham. Uh, so to close, I just simply want to reiterate uh, how much of an honor it is to be the 14th chairman of the CFTC, especially at this time. Uh, I've, I've been doing a lot of listening uh, both to my fellow commissioners as well as uh, going out, meeting the staff, not only here in Washington, but in Chicago, New York, and Kansas City. And uh, I'm excited. We have an opportunity to move into a new stage of the agency's history. I'll be announcing a strategic plan for the agency in the, in the coming weeks that, again, has sort of input from, from everyone. We'll identify several items we want to finalize from rulemakings to enhancement and agency operations. And overall, uh, at this point, the plan will have five themes. First, we must strengthen the resilience and integrity of our derivatives markets while fostering their vibrancy. Second, we must regulate our derivatives markets to promote the interests of all Americans. Third, we must encourage innovation and enhance the regulatory experience for market participants at home and abroad. Fourth, we've got to be tough on those who break the rules. And fifth, and finally, we must focus on our unique mission of the CFTC and improve our operational effectiveness. In sum, I'm committed to leading the agency and its amazing staff as we follow that path. We can write our future as an agency. We've developed an amazing amount of expertise in derivatives and commodities over the last 45 years, and our markets are strong, growing, and thriving. So let's find ways to work together to ensure our markets remain strong, have integrity, and that they work for all Americans. Uh, thanks so much. There being no further business, I would entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. I move to adjourn. Second. Those in favor of adjourning the meeting will say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Again, I want to thank the CFTC staff for their excellent work and dedication, and I'm grateful for everyone for attending this meeting. The meeting is hereby adjourned.